Uh, uh, I, I'm here to introduce uh, Tanya Hart, uh, who's coming from uh, Toronto. And you're part of the, what's the, the program called? It's the Public the Art Placemaker's, Placement? Uh, uh, Placemaker uh, Placemaker program. program, right? So yeah. Tanya's here to, uh, today. you're just installing everything today. Yeah. The, the work is here on campus at college and yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's right across from the Starbucks. Yes. Yes, she's pointing the wrong way. She is. It's that way. I just walked by it. You, you did? Yeah. Yes. So I saw it on my way. Yeah. Okay. That like, would feel like north. <laughs> it's not. It is north, but you're you're now north of where you installed. Oh. Because College Drive is there. Okay. So I think it's supposed to be between Cumberland and Bottom Lake. Yes. If anybody, I haven't yeah. seen it yet, but right, that's sort of where you saw it. Yes. Yeah. Cumberland and Bottom. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We literally, yeah, we dropped it off like. 11 this morning and we uh, you know just began installation I mean we sorted out the cords and the layout so I have to go back after the talk and finish the install and I fly out tonight you're flying out tonight yeah because I mean I came in Sunday to start the installation but you know um, Sunday being Sunday nothing's gonna happen and Monday suddenly it's snowing and that changed everything and everyone's schedule so uh, nothing is happening until today. Everything is happening today. Everything's happening today. So it's fine. We'll get done. I fly out, so it will that's be done. It. <laughs> it will be done. But you've done many public art projects. Yeah, yeah I'm beginning to. I mean, I'm. I feel still novice in the public art realm, but yeah, I've, I've got a number under my belt now. So it's okay. <laughs> yeah. I won't drink it while I'm talking. <laughs> Anyway, this intro has kind of turned into an interview more than anything else. I didn't mean That's why I prefer what, interviews. You know, what, <laughs> I prefer interviews. I'm not a else, monologue. <laughs> what else do I have here? You live and work in Toronto, but you were born in Newfoundland. You yes. weren't there for very long. No. But you did move to rural Ontario, where yes. you had a backyard that was 13 kilometers. Is that true? Yeah, you know what? It, it, was, um, it reminds me of High Park whenever I go there now. Like, we had such freedom. And I wish I had it for my daughter. But the, the landscape was so diverse. I mean, there was a pond right in the middle where we literally, we, there was a beaver that resided there, um, tons of frogs, and, and we used to catch the tadpoles. Like, my parents got us a, like a swimming pool, which quickly became an aquarium. And it was nothing but a huge <laughs> playground. It was amazing. Like, I wish I, I wish I could somehow still have it. Or maybe in the future I'll get but it. But I also read that you had no TV, so life wasn't perfect. No, it was. I mean, I'm not even a TV watcher now, which is probably because of that. I, yeah, my parents, we were allowed TV, but like an hour a day. So I got Gilligan's Island and Star Trek. Those were the two things I watched. But yeah, we weren't allowed TV. It was, you no, know, my mom would kick us out as soon as breakfast was over during the summer, and we were allowed back in at lunch. And out again, and that was it. That was that was growing up until like I think I was ten when we moved closer to a city. But we still had a huge backyard. Anyway, it was very idyllic. It was uh, honestly, it was it was a you know. But there, of course, you always wanted. I dreamt of having um, a home that I could walk to a gallery. Like I never had any of that. So there was anyway. There was pros and cons. But definitely, yeah, I had, a, I had a great childhood for, for exploring because, you know, we, um, we made stuff, we did stuff, like we were always building something or, or you know, destroying something. There's a lot of destruction. <laughs> that sounds like sculpture. Yes, you, it you is. You call yourself a sculptor, yes? Yes, I think yeah. so. Um, and in sculpture you do, you destroy more than you create, like by far. In fact, for... Uh, infra, it was such a struggle to, to make the work because I didn't know how to make it. Like, I proposed the idea, I'll get into the infra now before the talk is ended. Uh, when I started, I when I started infra, um, I had the idea long before I proposed it to Nui Blanche um, in Toronto. Um, but I didn't know how to make it. So I'll start actually with the beginning of the, the idea. The idea came when um, there was one day in Toronto when a deer had showed up in the middle of the financial district 
and nobody knew where it came from, and it stopped traffic, mesmerized everyone. It was in the news, it was, it was all over. And it struck me as odd that this deer could have such an effect. It was like an alien had landed. And it got me thinking about uh, the disconnect between, uh, you know, um, humans and non-humans, like the way we, uh, we treat wildlife as some sort of oddity. So the idea originated with making uh, a deer um, in the infrared. And I came to the infrared because it was something that we shared um, with uh, wildlife in that, you know, we both were energy. We were both, uh, you know, uh, vital systems that um, were heat based. So I thought if there was some way that I could represent uh, the deer as, um, as heat, like pure heat. So I thought the infrared. So uh, I started doing research on animals in cities. And this was the first image that popped up when I did research. And I'm sorry, I don't know the name of the artist that, that did this photo, but this was the photo that changed um, what I was gonna do. Instead of the deer, it became the wolf. Because there was just something so iconic about it. So anyway, that's, that's why it's the wolf and not the deer. But it was the deer that, that really changed it. So then, now I had the idea. I knew that I wanted to make the, the infrared, but infrared actually doesn't exist. It's not a, you know, it's, a, it's an image which is, you know, from um, a low-res camera. It's, it's not something that's really in three dimensions. So I had to figure out how I would do this. At this point, um, I knew that I was going to present it to Nuit Blanche. Nuit Blanche is an all-night festival. It's not just nighttime that I needed these wolves to be visible. I needed them to be um, day and night. So it was a difficult thing to come up with. So anyway, I started with drawings. Um, this I just did on the computer where I substituted some of the, some of the outer fur with um, the camouflage effect of the infrared. Because you had like a a definable pattern um, that you want to mimic, or that I did. So this, uh, I just had two uh, images of um, just preliminary drawings that I worked on. I did tons of these. Like I became quite obsessed with how to make the color palette because I mean, where is the heat really? And I mean, where would you see it? And yesterday I was reading up on the polar bear, which apparently is so insulated that it doesn't even show up on infrared because it's just so thick with the blubber. Anyway, so I didn't know where the heat would really be. So there was tons of that. And on my computer, I have so many of these images. And in fact, I started painting them because I just found it, um, I, I do, I, I love it. There's a lot of animals, but no, um, no wolves. Tons of other animals. So I did a lot of research. The total project for Infra was about nine months from you know conception to completion. This was an early uh, maquette that I did. It's just a small guy. Um, my initial thoughts were that I would work on the outside, the outer shell of the, the wolf, and I would project uh, light onto it. So, um, I began with, you know, uh, painting, finding different paints, but really uh, my first thought was that it was going to be uh, projected onto the wolf. But then uh, it didn't show up, you know, at nighttime. Like I would put light on this and it was, it just wasn't having the effect of heat from within. And I wanted, I wanted like a real um, visceral reaction. Like I wanted it to be immediate, that these things were, uh, on fire. This was just a life-size one. This guy, unfortunately, um, he was the full, first wolf that I made, but um, he's now completely painted white, and I, I painted a, I ordered this, um, it's probably toxic to all, but I ordered this toxic paint from the States, and I painted him like a, a glow-in-the-dark, which he glows all night long. 
but in absolute dark uh, conditions, like there can be no light. So he actually, he's quite cool, but he's in storage. He couldn't go anywhere. So this is an early pop. Um, this is when I decided that the light had to be within, so I wanted to make a shell. So I started working with the resin um, and the hex netting. This is him. Um, you can't really tell except for the eye, but it's the same guy. Um, what I did was, he now has the resin over him, um, but I pulled out all the hex uh, netting. So he's hollow. And my idea was that I would, because it all happened in stages, he's painted on the outside, but he's hollow, so my intent now is to put that light inside. Uh, this was just an early uh, mask. This is the light inside, but I didn't have the look I wanted, still. It wasn't, it was too bright, and the light uh, was taking away from any of the colors. So I went back to square one and um, looked for another way. And what I did was I found um, a material. Uh, this It's a polyurethane resin, and um, it's not quite your auto resin, um, but it's, it's something that is clear, which you can add a pigment, and it acts like almost like stained glass, so that when the light projects through it, the, the color is not lost. It's not um, uh, completely diffused. These are just early armatures I'm showing. This is the first layer of the fiberglass, which, you know, he was, I was tempted to leave him, because I really liked the look. But this was the first layer of the, the fiberglass with the lights inside. So at this point, I knew that I was getting close. Like I'm, you know, I feel the it's it's warm on the inside, and I'm. These are col these are the colors closer to uh, the infrared drawings that I saw, like the the maps, the weather, and the the other objects, like the bats and the the horse. And this is what it looked like in the day. So these are finished works, just in the studio. This is the first shot that we took at Nuit Blanche. It, I had three locations. Initially, when I proposed to them, it was just the three wolves. Um, but they liked the idea, and they had three locations, so they wanted me to make um, nine wolves. So that's what happened in the end, except um, for the, the ninth wolf, I decided to make two pups. So it's eight wolves and two pups. So this is the roof location, downtown Toronto. Um, I think it's the Cloud Gardens, if anyone knows Toronto. Um, this is installed, uh, it's actually in front of uh, Conrad Black's old building, where he used to work. Cloud Gardens. So these are finished works, which, I mean, you'll see tonight. This is in front of the Scotiabank Theatre. They gave me a great spot right there in front of the headquarters. And that's another artist's work there, the, the tractor. So that's the two pups and the, the adults. This one is installed. Um, so Nuit Blanche happened in September. Uh, I submitted them to Winterlude in Ottawa. Um, they were accepted, and this is them at Confederation Park. They gave me, it's actually very similar to this location. They just gave me a sprawling forest to put them in. So this is, uh, this is what, this is just a night shot. This is them set up there. They went back to Ottawa. Um, my project manager for the Winter Lute, uh, she really liked them and wanted to bring them back for a summer exhibit. Um, so they went back to Ottawa in June of this year and they were installed up until uh, a week ago, really. Um, I had them installed on a roof in the Byward Market, um, which was an interesting install, but that's them there. And that's the, this might actually be my last shot. That's just the other side. All of them were up on the roof. Yeah. So that's it, I think I covered it. <laughs> it's a lot of, you know what, I, I knew that by talking about them, I would end up talking a lot about uh, their production, because it was just, I mean, it's one thing to have an idea, 
but I find for myself, I don't know, I talk to friends who are artists and it's the same, you know, there's a lot of art speak out there, but it comes down to it, you spend more time thinking about how you're going to make it. Like the idea comes, it's an instant and that's it. Now it's how you're going to make it. And for Infra, that was, um, that was the case. It was nine months of, you know, how do I, and to be honest, I'm still not entirely satisfied. I know there's a better medium or I think it would be better as purely light, like the, the lights themselves, you know, make up the, the body even. Um, but that's what you become obsessed with, not so much the theoretical end. I'd rather leave that to someone else, what the idea means or whatever. Like I do love writing about the idea, but I decided that um, really what I wanted to tell you today was, you know, about the, the production. It's, um, it's, it is the bulk of the work. Tanya, might there be a, a future different iteration of this, of this piece? I think so. <clears throat> he, there may be, yes. Yeah. I'm not sure. I mean, I, the, I'm working on something right now which is um, just similar. Uh, so, I mean, maybe the resolutions that I come to that may, you know, give me a, another avenue to improve this. Um, yeah, it's possible. We'll see. Can you say anything about how this work relates to other things that you have done? Like, not that. Oh it yeah, no. It actually, it's it. Um, this is exactly what I've been doing for uh, like the last five years. Like, especially to do with um, uh, how uh, we react to animals, um, not in just our cities, but just in our spaces. Before, before I heard about the deer in the financial district in Toronto, you know, I was reading about, I mean, if you Google wildlife in, in cities or spaces, I mean, the stories go on and on. Like, um, another work which I did um, a couple years ago was based on this bear that wandered into um, Fort Francis, Alberta. And this bear, it was home there, and it was perfectly, um, no, not in Port Francis, sorry, it started in Canmore. It was home in Canmore, um, and nobody really um, gave it any trouble until one day they decided they changed their policies and the bear was really no longer welcome. It was always doing the same thing, like, you know, at the dump, outside, city limits, whatever. And so one day they decided, no, this bear cannot stay here. Um, so they kept shipping it north uh, into Banff, like into the mountains. And it would just wander home. And it did it like three times before they took it, like so far north that it got lost. And it wandered into another city where within hours the bear was shot, dead, gone. And I just couldn't... Um, fathom the lack of ingenuity to this situation like this is our resolve you know it goes from like you know um, you know surviving within a habitat not that it's a solution by no means but the whole issue was just lacked um, resolve or even attention like it was hitting the newspaper so it had an audience but it just it was such a Anyway, it inspired me. So from that, the first thing I did when I, um, the first idea I got from that was to make a children's book. Not for children though, because, you know, the first thing that struck me was, you know, there's no way we would, we would treat, we would tell a child about that story. Yet it's a story um, that if we could tell a child, uh, we would be ashamed. So I wrote the same news story. I took it like verbatim and I made a children's book and I made beautiful illustrations and there's no way I'd give it to a child, but um, you read the story and I haven't been able to really actually, 
I got a great rejection letter from, who gave it to me? I was able to get connected with um, Harper's, this publisher, this children's publisher. It was, a, it was a great connection. And I was like, I shouldn't use this connection with this book because I knew it would get rejected. But she wrote me a great rejection letter that, you know, I almost want to put in my resume. But anyway, because it, it can't really be published as is. Um, but yeah, that was, that was the first work. But you know, the one I'm working on now is the same idea. You know, it's about a polar bear that, you know, what do you do with them? What, what, like, what do you do? So anyway, it, it of course is, uh, it's come up in this and in a number of other projects. Well, I, I'm sorry that I didn't actually finish my introduction and, 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 and go through your resume a little more, but you were the founder of the uh, sculpture garden and curated a number of shows there. So yeah. With a, with, now that was a collective, was it? Yeah, it was, that was the basis. It was a collective. It, there was 25 of us. Um, but they, uh, they just submitted their work to a portfolio and they uh, let me just um, uh, sell it to as many different venues as possible. We went to garden tours, trade shows, um, there was a couple city events we did, um, yeah, uh, I mean, but we were speaking earlier about it, I mean, how do you want me to relate to it? Because I mean, with that, I mean, I found it, we were trying to find a way um, to connect to, to the public um, in a very direct manner. I mean, that was the purpose of that group. Um, but it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a business plan, you know. But in the end, I mean, people prefer the the junk and stuff. Um, I mean, really, because I mean, what do you do with fine art? Like many of the sculptors in the portfolio, I mean, these were like huge bronze works, beautiful stone works. Like the portfolio was beautiful, and you you know, it's a difficult sell. <laughs> so like. You know, here you go, uh, there's like a $20,000 sculpture for your front lawn. Anyway, it wasn't completely thought out, it was a lot of uh, dreamy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but just to say that you've been involved in, in putting your work out in public, that seems to be a oh, kind of ongoing that. Yes. interest of yours, and also the relationship of your work, artwork to nature. Those two things. Yes. Well, yes. From the very beginning, because initially, when I, when I was in school, I did nothing but painting. I mean, I did some sculpture, but uh, I always thought I was a painter. I did a lot of two D, um, and I took a bronze class and a sculpture class. And the professors were like, "No, you're a sculptor. You should be sculpting." And I'd always kind of resisted it because to be a painter is easier. I'm not going to say it's easy. But what's nice is um, logistically, you roll up stuff, and you can put everything under your bed, and you can live in the, you know, the, you know, one room studio, and you're fine. As a sculptor, you've got issues. Like you make, you make anything larger than, you know, something to fit on a pedestal. You've got major problems. Like you've got storage and workspaces and ventilation and blah blah blah. So I always kind of resisted it. But then it's just inevitable. So, yeah. Yeah, I've got major <laughs> stuff. Yeah. You Most know, a lot of your work is uh, shown outside. Are you opposed to having uh, the work shown in a gallery space? No, I, I try to have a solo every year, or I've tried to, tried to make that my goal. Um, like I had a solo uh, last year, and it was all indoor works. In fact, there was um, it was mostly two uh, D. I had a, a bunch of works which were kind of relief, but um, no, I, I'm definitely not outside a gallery at all. I mean, it's just that the work um, it does relate to uh, nature, so it's it's in its place when it's outside. But uh, I would love even for these wolves to be inside because then I could finally test um, 
the pigment on those which react to UV lighting. So if they were an indoor space, because you can't control outside, like outside there's so much um, light noise that there's no way I could get black lighting to react the way they would. So I've never seen that whole pack lit up with black lighting, which they're totally capable of doing. So yeah, I no, I, I like the gallery setting. I'm not I'm not opposed to it. I like the white cube. Absolutely. But I also like odd places, you know, like putting art where people don't expect it. You know, you putting it in Sorry? You not since high school. <laughs> yeah, people used to steal my sculptures actually. <laughs> But that's high school. <laughs> yeah, no, not yet. Are these constructed so you can change the lights? Like, do you have to change the lights when you display them? Yeah. Um, they were made for Nuit Blanche, um, which is a one night deal. And I, you know, there, there wasn't a lot of foresight beyond that. So, each wolf is a little bit different, you know, because I kept changing and improving, I hope, as I went along. So some of them are hollow. Uh, some of them still have the infrastructure, depending on what I thought would work. Um, but eventually the lights will have to change because they can't last forever in their present, you know, manifestation. So this work will be up for how long? It's there till uh, May, six months. Okay. Though it's somewhat open. At the moment, six months. That's right. That's what I saw it, but there's clauses. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of clauses. Good. Any more questions or comments? Maybe we can break and you can uh, hang out with us a little bit and we can ask you yeah. questions. Thank you very much.